Hey everybody, it's Tony here with my review of Giuseppe Verdi's La Forza del Destino, which I saw at the Deutsche Oper Berlin. The conductor was Paolo Carignani, the production was done by Frank Kastoff, the sets were done by Alexander Denitz, the costumes were done by Adriana braga Peretsky. the lights were handled by Lothar Baumgarte, the video designers and cinematographers were Andreas Deinert, Katrin Kotenthaler, and Marie von Riedesheimer. The assistant director was Neil Barry Moss, the chorus master was Jeremy Bynes, and the dramaturg was Jörg Königsdorf. I was really excited to check out La Forza del Destino by Giuseppe Verdi because I mainly knew this opera through its melodramatic story, although the plot does tend to meander with the comedic characters, as well as some of its most famous arias. From Leonora's solo numbers, Me Pellegrina ed Orfana, Son Giunta, which then leads into Madre Pietosa Vergine, La Vergine degli Angeli, and her most famous aria, Pace Pace Mio Dio, which in turn is a very popular concert piece for many dramatic sopranos as well as pinto sopranos, to Don Alvaro's La Vita e Inferno, to Don Carlo di Vargas's Urna Fatale, and Son Pereda, to Padre Guardiano's Il Santo Nome, to Fra Melitone's Toto Po Fare Il Mondo, and to Preciosilla's three solo arias along with the chorus, Al Suon del Tamburro, Venita Lindovina, and Rataplan. Interestingly enough, this opera premiered on November 10, 1862 in St. Petersburg, Russia, with some completely different arrangements to the music, especially where Prezzo Silas Venita Lindovina is concerned, as well as a much more tragic ending with Don Alvaro committing suicide by jumping off a cliff. And it then had its Italian premiere six months and three months later in Milan, specifically on February 27, 1869, where Don Alvaro still lives. And the second version is the standard version usually performed in opera houses all over the world. Another interesting tidbit with Verdi's La Forza del Destino is the superstition surrounding this opera, which is very much akin to William Shakespeare's Macbeth, in which if the name of that play is said, a curse will be present among not only the actors, but also everybody involved. In fact, akin to what happens with Shakespeare's Macbeth, Uttering Verdi's La Forza del Destino does promise some premonitions. For instance, in 1960, Leonard Warren, after he sang his solo aria Urna Fatale, collapsed on stage and eventually died at the age of 49 years old. And then you have Luciano Pavarotti, who refused to perform this opera in its entirety because of the many superstitions involved. And you also had Franco Corelli, who was one of the most well-known interpreters of Don Alvaro, reciting some pre-performance rituals before he can get on stage so that he will not be cursed. So this opera does have some very interesting history going behind it. From its two performance premieres, one in Russia and then in Italy, to its superstitions occurring from Leonard Warren's unfortunate death, to the rituals that Franco Corelli had to say and recite before performing this opera. Nevertheless, Verdi's La Forza del Destino is still performed all over the world and has remained in the standard operatic repertoire thanks to its arias, its ensembles, its choruses, and even its famous overture, which also has that fate leitmotif playing to show that these are the characters who are involved in this game of destiny as well as the unavoidable fate that befalls on each of them, especially Leonora, Carlo, and Alvaro. The plot of this opera goes like this. Donna Leonora di Vargas, who is the younger daughter of the Marquis de Calatrava and the younger sister of Don Carlo di Vargas, is madly in love with Don Alvaro, who is a South American nobleman of Indio blood. Her nurse cura does bear some concern of Leonora's total infatuation with Don Alvaro because 
her father and her brother are totally against him given his heritage as well as the fact that him being an Indio would be completely taboo to the Vargas family. Nevertheless, Alvaro and Leonora plan to consummate their feelings to each other. However, the Marquis interrupts their little affair by wanting a duel with Don Alvaro. Just as Don Alvaro is about to surrender, he drops his pistol it goes off, the stray bullet lands on the Marquis, and he ends up dying, cursing his younger daughter. Several months pass, and her older brother, Don Carlo de Vargas, is in hot pursuit of both Don Alvaro and his younger sister. He disguises himself as the doctorate student, Pereda, and wants to search for the whereabouts of both Alvaro and Leonora, although his disguise does not fool the gypsy girl slash Vivian Diel, Preziosilla, who could see beyond his disguise and recognizes that he's not really a student, although Don Carlo exclaims that he is Pereda and he is a well-traveled student who not only did his university work in Salamanca, but wants to go to America to further pursue his studies. Meanwhile, Leonora, who is still in hot pursuit by Don Carlo, flees to a monastery and asks Padre Guardiano, as well as the oafish Franciscan friar Fra Melitone, to take refuge not only with them, but the rest of the Franciscan friars. She takes up her oath to the Lord and ends up living life among the monks and the priests of the church. Don Carlos and Don Alvaro's paths intersect, especially since they go under different aliases serving for the Spanish army. Don Carlo names himself Don Felice, while Don Alvaro names himself Don Fernando Herreros, who is the captain of the Spanish army. Sure, Don Alvaro leads the Spanish army to victory in the hopes of uniting Spain and Italy, but he is almost mortally wounded, thus motivating Don Carlo to stay by Don Alvaro's side until he is healed well. Sensing some suspicion of his new friend, Don Carlo searches the casket of Don Alvaro through a key that he has acquired from him, only to find out that inside Don Alvaro's casket is the locket containing Leonora's picture. Does he ultimately know that Don Fernando Herreras is actually Don Alvaro, the man who inadvertently killed his father from a stray bullet through a pistol that ended up going out when it dropped on the floor. Now knowing who Don Carlos' father's murderer was, he immediately confronts Don Alvaro and wants to settle the score with him once he is fully healed. Although Don Carlo and Don Alvaro immediately recognize each other not as friends anymore, but as enemies, they want to settle the score and will end up in a duel much later in the opera, although the story meanders with the side characters of Mastro Trabucco, who is a muleteer, along with Preziosilla, Fra Meritone, and a surgeon preparing for the war between Spain and its invaders, as well as rejoicing in the unity of Spain and Italy, thus motivating Preziosilla and the people to prepare themselves for battle against the enemies, while also rejoicing in the fact that the soldier's life is the great life for them. Back to Don Carlo and Don Alvaro, Don Alvaro pleads for forgiveness after everything that he's done, but Don Carlo is still so bent on revenge and death against Don Alvaro for what he's done to his father. And Don Carlo insults him and a duel then ensues. Leonora, who has ended up living her life as a hermit, prays for peace until she hears somebody entering her cave home that it is none other than Don Alvaro who himself is wounded from a battle that he had with Don Carlo. Leonora then confronts Don Carlo only for herself to be stabbed by him, thus fulfilling his need for revenge. But as Leonora dies from her wounds and Don Alvaro pleads for her not to die, Padre Guardiano enters the scene again and absolves Leonora from her iniquities 
as well as absolves Don Alvaro also from his iniquities and even absolves Don Carlo from his lust for revenge. Ultimately, Don Alvaro survives penitent and living on, although in the original 1862 version, Don Alvaro ends up committing suicide by jumping off a cliff, thus making the whole opera tragic to the bone. Sure, La Forza de Destino is filled to the brim with melodrama, especially motivated by some of the characters really stupid decisions with Don Alvaro dropping his pistol only for it to go off sending a stray bullet flying to the Marquis de Calatrava's body only for him to curse Leonora. Leonora, Don Alvaro and Don Carlo having their separate set of disguises to evade from each other as well as to conceal their identities only for them to intersect at the very end but only for Leonora to be killed, as well as for Don Carlo to be killed, and for Don Alvaro to find forgiveness in the 1869 version, but find death in the 1862 version. And while this story is filled to the brim with melodrama, it does meander with the comedic elements, which feels like a completely different opera altogether, through the comedic characters of Mastro Trabucco, Preziosilla, and Fra Melitone, who try to lighten the mood of the opera, but otherwise make the entire story really distracting. Nevertheless, they still have wonderful music to sing, as well as some interesting bantering going on between some of the main characters. What with Preziosilla bantering with Don Carlo, Mastro Trabuco also bantering with Don Carlo, and Fra Melitone having his yin-yang banters with Padre Guardiano. With all of that said, let's get on to what I thought about the production. I was not a huge fan of Frank Castor's production of La Forza del Destino. It appears extremely cluttered with different influences from Spain, Italy, and the Americas all meshed into one. And what I noticed about this production was that it was transported from Italy and Spain in the 1700s to Spain and Italy and South America during the 1920s especially during Francisco Franco's regime. Given that there is a poster of him in the very first act of the opera, as well as the Marquis de Calatrava presenting himself as a sort of dictator. There's also different film screens throughout this production, which although tries to to expound the characters a lot more, especially what they're doing behind the scenes, it just felt ultimately so distracting to watch because I came to this production to see how the characters interact with each other without the need for all of those screens being shown. Furthermore, Preciosilla in this production is dressed up as some sort of call girl given her fancy attires. And what I also noticed about this production of La Forza del Destino is that there are some dialogues, monologues, and some scenes that are just added in just for the sake of wanting something to be spoken. And most of the dialogue is in German, specifically in the first act. Instead of the Marquis de Calatrava falling to his death, we see him arising up again as if though that the flesh wound that he had was nothing, especially if it's from a bullet. And he's reciting a monologue about seashells, oysters, and a lot of discoveries from the sea, only for it to reveal that the shells have human eyeballs in them, just for the sake of being shocking. There's even a monologue said by Fra Melitone in German, in terms of Leonora being consecrated by the Franciscan priests. And throughout the opera, there is the presence of a First Nation South American native called the Indio, who functions as a sort of witch doctor, as well as a sort of angel of destiny. And the Indio also has a monologue that he first says in German, and even switches to Portuguese, even though the entire opera is set in Spain and also has a character of Inca descent from Peru, Don Alvaro, which meant that he's supposed to also speak some Spanish or any of Peru's 
old dialects instead of resorting to Brazilian Portuguese. And there's also another moment where Cura and the mayor have a dialogue with each other completely in English, and the mayor is also given the name of Jimmy, although in Italian it would be Giacomo. But I digress. And here's something that was also quite distracting. During Prezzosilla's Rataplan, there's also a Tom and Jerry-like sequence going on between the surgeon and Mastro Trabuco, as well as a flag bearer who constantly enters inside and outside the scene, which was really distracting. And Leonora doesn't die in this opera so much as she is transfigured to state that her soul can move on from this sad mortal earth. Despite some very unusual directions with this production of La Forza del Destino, some of the costumes were really gorgeous, such as Leonora's dresses. And I also dare not forget about Preziosila's costumes, which make her come off as a sort of call girl as well as some sort of vaudeville dancer. But other than that, the added dialogues as well as the Indio's presence could have been cut all together and nothing would change. In fact, it feels like I am watching not only this main opera, but three other pieces of work from the dialogues between the Marquis de Calatrava and Cura to the Indio's monologue, to the dialogue going on between Jimmy, the mayor, and Cura. They felt like completely different entities, which was otherwise very distracting and kind of annoying, although the Indio's monologue is interesting in of itself, if it were performed in another piece. So overall, this production of La Forza de Destino was all over the place. It had some interesting directions going for it, but other than that, I cannot recommend Frank Castor's production of La Forza de Destino to anybody, especially when it comes to total newbies to Verdi's La Forza de Destino. If you want to know how this entire opera is played, please go check out a traditional production. But if you already know this opera and want to have something a little bit more experimental, I might not give this a go because it is distracting and at times it does feel like it does meander a whole lot more than just having the comic characters contribute a lot of fluff to the entire opera. So I would not recommend this production of La Forza de Destino. You might as well stick with a traditional one. Now we get to the singer, starting off with Hulkar Sabirova as Dona Leonora de Vargas. Dona Leonora de Vargas does need either a spinto soprano or a dramatic soprano to sing over an orchestra. She essentially needs to combine the steeliness of Lady Macbeth, Abigail, and Zenta with the virginal qualities associated with Chrysotemis from Electra and the Marshallin from the Rosenkavalier, as well as the overall complete package and flair for drama evident in Floria Tosca from Puccini's Tosca and Mini from La Fanciulla del West, also by Puccini. Aside from combining that power and steel evident in roles such as Abigail and Lady Macbeth with that virginal quality found in Chrysotemis, Freya, and the Marshallin, as well as singing over that orchestra just like her Wagnerian sister Zenta does in the Fliegende Hollander, she has also attracted a great deal of spinto and dramatic sopranos, such as Celestina Borinsegna, Bianca Scacciatti, Gina Cinia, Maria Caniglia, Maria Pedrini, Valburga Vegna, Renata Tebaldi, Maria Callas, Montserrat Caballé, and Dame Gwyneth Jones. There is no doubt that Donna Leonora is extremely challenging for many a dramatic or spinto soprano singing this particular role because she has a total of four arias from Me Pellegrina d'Orfana to Son Junta, which then leads up to Madre Pietosa Vergine to La Vergine degli Angeli and arguably her most famous aria Pace Pace Mio Dio in which she does need to combine her chest tones in In Mezzo Tanto a Tanto Duol and even have blazing top notes in the final maledizione. 
Therefore, Dona Leonora de Vargas is a challenging sing and a huge sing for many a dramatic and spinto soprano alike. And Hulkar Sabirova was solid in this role. She managed to sing the role well with everything she's got. She had really good head voice in terms of hitting the low notes as well as some decent chest tones. And she had an overall fine quality to her voice thanks to maintaining that beautiful quality that she has been very well known for for many years to make this character come alive. However, I am still missing that extra meatiness and that extra steel and that extra metal that I've come to love in many a true spinto slash true dramatic soprano singing Leonora de Vargas. First of all, I found her voice to be a tad bit light for singing Leonora de Vargas. Sure, as I stated before, she sang everything well. She managed to navigate both the highs and the lows of this aria, as well as couple this with some really fine pianissimo singing. However, the fact remains that Hulkar Sabirova's voice is not totally ideal for something as dramatic and huge such as Dona Leonora de Vargas. Her voice is sufficiently pliable if given the right repertoire. In fact, this is a voice that is more suitable in singing the likes of Amalia from Imad Nadieri, Mimi from La Boheme, Chocho San from Madame Butterfly, Liu from Turandot, Giovanna d'Arco, Giselda from I Lombardi alla Prima Crociata, Elvira from Ernani, Luisa Miller, Alzira from Verdi's Alzira, Medora from Il Corsaro, Mistress Alice Ford from Falstaff, and even Michaela from Carmen, and not something like Dona Leonora de Vargas. Despite the issues I had with Hulkar Sabirova as Leonora de Vargas, she was still able to sing everything well with everything that she's got, all thanks to her well-coordinated voice, although her voice could be of better service in the more lyrical roles, as well as in roles that call for more flexibility, such as, as I stated before, Amalia from Masnadieri, Giovanna d'Arco, Luisa Miller, as well as Giselda from I Lombardi alla Prima Crociata. These are roles that I believe are much more suitable for Hulkar Sabirova, and she should really leave the role of Leonor di Vargas for a true spinto slash dramatic soprano. In fact, I would have really loved to hear Sayo Hernandez sing the role of Dona Leonora de Vargas because she is one of the finest exponents of the spinto slash dramatic soprano repertoire that we have today. And I'm pretty sure that Senora Hernandez's voice will suit the role of Dona Leonora de Vargas far better than what Hulkar Sabirova managed to deliver. Regardless of everything that I've said about Hulkar Sabirova, caveats and all, in terms of her voice not being ideal for Leonora, I still have to give her credit for what she was able to do vocally as well as theatrically. She managed to bring in some amount of strength to this character and vulnerability rolled up into one fine package. And I definitely have to salute Hulkar Sabirova for managing to do such a fine job as Dona Leonora de Vargas. Saying the role of Don Alvaro was Jorge de Leon. Don Alvaro is just as much of a big sing as his lover Dona Leonora de Vargas. In fact, this role needs either a dramatic tenor or a head and tenor who can sing over an orchestra. He needs that masculine quality found in roles such as Sigmund from Die Valkyrie, Tannhäuser from Tannhäuser, Tristan, Rienzi, Otello, Radames, Stifelio, and even have Dick Johnson's blazing high notes, as well as sufficient vocal heft found in other roles such as Sanson from Sanson et Dalila, and Herodes from Salome, as well as Egist from Electra. Many famous exponents of Don Alvaro include Giovanni Martinelli, Giacomo Lauri Volpi, Giovanni Zaratello, Aureliano Pertile, Francisco Vignas, Franco Corelli, Mario del Monaco, Richard Tucker, Rudolf Schock, and Lawrence Feigenberger. Whether the tenor is a spinto tenor or a dramatic tenor or a held in tenor, there has been no shortage of tenors who sang this particular role with abandon and passion. And I thought that Jorge de Leon was, as always, 
superb in terms of his clarion high notes and how much he was able to let his metallic voice ring throughout the theater. While I do love the metal, the steel, and the overall strength that he had in his voice, I still can't deny the fact that there was a wobble in his voice that tended to be distracting, but is otherwise a small price to pay for what is otherwise a huge voice that managed to ring throughout the theater. I have been following Senor de Leon's career for quite some time. I've heard him as Radames, I've heard him as Cavaradossi, I've heard him as Calaf, and I've heard him in all of these great Italianate spinto slash dramatic tenor roles. And his voice showed no signs of stopping whatsoever. The only caveat that I've had with Jorge de Leon's voice is that there is a wobble that is present in his voice as well as some tremolos to be found. And those vocal flaws can never be overlooked. But despite the issues that I had with Jorge de Leon's voice, it's still a voice that is sufficiently present and that also has that fine technique that managed to unite both the highs of his voice as well as the lows and the middles of his voice really, really well. And he sang his heart out so much. Yes, you could accuse him for not being totally subtle and not being additionally nuanced with how he was delivering his voice. But I could forgive all that in terms of how much Jorge de Leon managed to let his voice ring throughout the theater with pizzazz as well as with sufficient manly machismo that I love in many a spinto, dramatic, or held in tenor singing Don Alvaro. So I still have to give him loads of kudos for what he was able to accomplish and I also continue to salute him for all of his fine and sturdy efforts. Roman Burdenko was just as fine as Leonora's brother, Don Carlo de Vargas. And this role is just as coveted for many a Verdi baritone. In fact, Verdi baritones who sang Don Carlo de Vargas would also sing the likes of Rigoletto, Giorgio Germont, Conte di Luna, Nabucco, Il Vecchio Miller, Amonasro, Tonio from Pagliacci, Marcello from La Boheme, Scarpia from Tosca, Sharpless from Madama Butterfly, Donner from Das Rheingold, Mandrika from Arabella, Le Comte Neve from Les Huguenots, D'Apertutto from Le Comte of Man, and even Il Conte d'Almaviva from Mozart's Le Nozze di Figaro. There has been no shortage of baritones who sang Don Carlo de Vargas, including Ettore Bastianini, Carlo Tagliabue, Herman Pry, Mattia Battistini, Tita Rufo, Tito Gobbi, Robert Merrill, who, mind you, is one of my most personal favorites of all time, and another favorite of mine, Cheryl Milnes, all thanks to his blazing top notes, oh, and lest I forget about Lawrence Tibbet and Leonard Warren, who was also the unfortunate victim as to what happened to him back in 1960 when he collapsed on stage after he sang Urna Fatale. And what you also need in this voice is not only a strong Verdi baritone sound, but also great coordination with head voice and chest voice, as well as an overall roundness that makes this character both menacing yet determined at the same time. And I thought that Roman Burdenko managed to do a fine job as Don Carlo de Vargas. Yes, he may not have had that roundness and richness that I love in Lawrence Tibbet, let alone Robert Merrill, or even that incisiveness that I love in Cheryl Milnes. However, what he managed to do with Don Carlo de Vargas was imbue him with sufficient virility. In fact, I saw the same baritone as Scarpia, and while I thought he did a fine job with that role, I thought that he managed to be a lot better as Don Carlo de Vargas. His stage presence, which was virile and strong, as well as his baritone voice, which had sufficient strength, although it could be a lot rounder and richer, were the hallmarks as to what made Roman Burdenko stand out so superbly. So even though Roman Burdenko's voice is not one I would easily associate with all of these huge Verdi baritone roles, it still has sufficient presence and strength that made him a lot stronger as a vocal performer 
and somebody that I will continue to watch for many years to come. So here's also hoping for stronger performances with Roman Bordenko as well as further strengthening of his technique for many years to come because that is a voice that could sing well. It just needs to gain in depth and strength and darkness that will make him shine like the brightest of diamonds. Marco Mimitsa actually grew in strength as Padre Guardiano and this role calls for either a basso cantante or a basso profondo to sing this particular priest. Many basses who sing Padre Guardiano would then go on to sing both Philip II and the Grand Inquisitor from Don Carlo, Ramfis from Aida, Sparafucile from Rigoletto, Jacopo Fiesco from Simon Boccanegra, Sarastro from the Zauberflöte, both Il Commendatore and Don Giovanni from Mozart's Don Giovanni, Osmin in some cases from Mozart's The Entführung aus dem Serail, Fafner and Fasold from Das Rheingold, König Heinrich der Vogler from Lohengrim, Landgraf Hermann from Tannhäuser, König Marke from Tristan und Isolde, and both Titorell and Gurnemans from Parsifal. Well known interpreters of this role include Gottlob Frick, Giulio Neri, Josef Greindl, Jerome Hines, Giorgio Tozzi, Cesare Sieppi, and Nikolai Gyaurov, and lest I forget about Evgeny Nesterenko and Paul Pliska, just to name a few of the many basses who sang Padre Guardiano and made great use of his beautiful music. Sonorousness of voice aside, he also needs a strong stage presence to make this priest come to life, and I thought that Marco Mimitsa's voice did grow in sufficient sonorousness although it did have that throatiness that otherwise marred his performance. But despite that vocal caveat, I thought that Marco Mimitsa was a strong vocal performer as I have seen him grow from strength to strength from his years as a young singer singing Oroveso from Norma and even Capello from I Capuleti e Montechi to seeing him just blossom in that role so well. I thought he was able to sing Il Padre Guardiano with sufficient tenderness, virility, and manliness that I love in many a true basso cantante slash basso profondo. Yes, Marco Mimitsa is more of a basso cantante, but that is not to diminish his talents as a fine singer. In fact, he was also one of the finest show stealers of the evening aside from Jorge de Leon and Roman Burdenko. So I also have to give my hat off to him for doing such a superb job as Padre Guardiano. Steven Bronk may have shown vocal tiredness as the Marco Marquesa di Calatrava, but he was still vocally strong all around. Yes, Il Marquesa di Calatrava or the Marquis di Calatrava is not really such a huge sing compared to his other bass colleague, Il Padre Guardiano. But what he does need is also either a basso cantante or a basso profondo to make the best out of this otherwise thankless character. Some basses who sing the role of Il Marquesa di Calatrava would also venture on to singing the likes of Leporello from Don Giovanni. Dr. Bartolo from Le Nozze di Figaro, and even Le Comte de Sombri from Maya Bez Les Huguenots. And there has been no shortage of character bases, let alone aspiring basso cantantes who sang this particular role, including Silvio Maionica and Giovanni Foyanni. And Stephen Bronk managed to deliver the goods in this otherwise thankless role, all thanks to his tall stage presence, as well as his sufficiently virile basso cantante voice, which still had that fine quality to it and also added in that aged quality that made the Marquesa de Calatrava come alive as a character. So kudos to him for doing such a fine job with this particular role. Patrick Rowan was sufficiently tall as the mayor, and this role is of slight importance as compared to Padre Guardiano and Marquesa de Calatrava because he mainly appears in the second act, but it's also attracted some character bases to sing this role. And one of them includes Dario Caselli and Patrick Rowan as as I stated before, used his fine bass baritone voice and his tall stage presence to make the role of the mayor come to life as well as give him sufficient urgency. And even his little dialogue scene with Karis Tucker as Kura was quite cute, although it might as well be a separate 
piece altogether. Nevertheless, Patrick Rowan still continues to show a lot of potential in terms of his growth as an overall singing actor, and I cannot wait to see what the future has in store for Mr. Rowan. Philip Yeka's voice as Fra Meritone leaves a lot to be desired because his voice is more of a lyric baritone. And lest they forget about Fra Meritone, that this is a role that calls for a bass baritone, a basso buffo, or even a character baritone with sufficient low notes and great comic timing to make this grumpy, cantankerous, and grouchy Franciscan friar come to life. Famous interpreters of Fra Melitone include Gerhard Pechna, Fernando Corena, Melchiore Luise, Carlo Badioli, Sir Garrett Evans, Sesto Bruscantini, and my personal all-time favorite, Ezio Flagello, who has encompassed both the bass baritone and the basso cantante, as well as some basso profondo roles. Out of all the singers I've mentioned, including Gabriel Bacquier, one of my most favorite French baritones of all time, Ezio Flagello stands head and shoulders above the rest as my personal favorite, all thanks to that voice being suitable and probably the most ideal for someone like Fra Melitone. Philippe Yeka's voice did lack that additional depth and richness that I would have loved in any baritone or bass baritone, let alone bass singing Fra Melitone. In fact, voices that come into my mind are not only of Ezio Flagello's voice, but also Saturno Meletti's, who had a well-developed baritone voice, and lest I forget about Alfredo Mariotti, who had a beautiful basso cantante voice, but he was also specializing in the more comical roles. With Philippe Yekal, I thought that his voice was ill-suited to this grouchy priest. This is a baritone who should actually sing the likes of Valentin from Faust and Mercutio from Gounod's Romeo et Juliette. Not something like Fra Melitone, which needs extra depth extra meatiness, and extra roundness and darkness. And there were also occasions in which his chest voice sounded rather hollow, which is a huge shame because Philip Yeka is a naturally fine lyric baritone, although his tessitura and tambra sounds more tenorish to my ears. However, I still have to give him some acclaim in terms of what he was able to do with Fra Meritone. He didn't make him go all over the top, let alone all blustery as a character. In fact, this is a Fra Meritone that is quite calculating, but also maintains his sufficient grouchiness, without shouting at everybody. Despite Philippe Yeka's voice being extremely ill-suited for Fra Melitone's depth and richness, I still have to give him credit for what he was able to do with Fra Melitone in terms of making him come to life as a character, as well as finding some serious moments with this otherwise grouchy yet comical Franciscan friar. Ya Chung Huang was superb as Mastro Trabuco, and it's also thanks to his fine light lyric tenor voice that made this particular muleteer come to life. Yes, Mastro Trabuco may not be so well loved in a lot of the character tenor parts, i.e. Mime from both Das Rheingold and Siegfried, as well as the young sailor from Tristan und Isolde, as well as the shepherd also from that very same opera. And lest I forget about Spoletta from Tosca, Goro from Madama Butterfly, and even Gerardo from Janiskiki. But Mastro Trabuco's music, especially in the ensemble pieces, is absolutely gorgeous, and it does require a fine character tenor to sing this role. There have been some famous character tenors who sang Mastro Trabuco, including Franco Ricciardi and Piero de Palma, who have also had very great careers careers as character tenors, and it does take a good character tenor to make this role memorable, and Ya Chung Huang certainly did just that, all thanks to his beautiful light lyric tenor voice that managed to burst through the orchestra with beauty and sufficient manliness, thus making my heart melt every time he opened his mouth to sing. I also loved 
his physical comedy, especially since he is the butt monkey in this opera, being pushed around by Roman Mordenko's Don Carlo, or even pursued by Byungil Kim Surgeon, who I will gladly talk about much later in this review, and his overall dedication to his craft as a singer cannot be questioned. Yana Kurotsova was a sufficiently gorgeous preziosilla, putting her stage presence and her sufficiently plush voice to fine use for this otherwise needless character, but she was still able to do a fine job with hitting those high notes as well as digging into some really fine chest tones as well as using her head voice well. Say what you will about Preciosila. Say what you will about her music and her presence throughout the entire opera being completely superfluous and completely inconsequential to the entire plot. Although she did have her banter with Don Carlo in the second act of the opera. But I will always argue that it takes a skilled mezzo-soprano to make Preciosila come to life as a character. And this role is completely thankless. You not only have Preciosila belting out some high Bs and high B flats, as well as a cadenza to the high C, which also goes into soprano territory, but this is a role that does require skilled singing, especially in the coloratura, as well as some really long and florid lines and the trills that she has to produce. Preciosila is technically a falcon soprano role, and it's borderline falcon because of the high notes that she has to sing and those top notes that she either has to prolong or even attack with everything that she's got. In fact, I would even argue that Preciosila does need the top notes of a Zeglinda, a Kundri, or even a Brangena to combine with those middle notes found in roles such as Herodias from Salome, Meg Page from Falstaff, Fenena from Nabucco, and even the chest tones found in Die Ame or The Nurse from the Frau Una Schatten and even Laura Adorno from La Gioconda. Famous exponents of Preziosilla include Gianna Pedersini, Ebe Stignani, Elena Nicolai, Giulietta Simeonato, Marta Mördl, although she was also a very well-known Wagnerian soprano, Krista Maria Ziese, Genia Guslatsevic, Sigrid Kehl, Shirley Verrett, Grace Bumbry, Fiorenza Cosotto, and even Helga Dernesch, who also started out as a mezzo before singing a lot of the spinto soprano slash dramatic soprano roles and reverted back to mezzo and even more contralto roles much later in her career. So there is no doubt that Preziosilla, as thankless as this role is, as unnecessary as this role is in La Forza del Destino as a whole, it's still a challenging sing for many a dramatic mezzo-soprano or even a mezzo-soprano who could also sing soprano roles. And Yana Kurutsova, although she's not really as great as my personal favorite Preziosillas, including Gianna Pedersini, Ebestignani, Elena Nicolai, or even Giulietta Simeonato, I thought that she was able to do a serviceable job with this particular role. She did attack those chest tones rather well, she used her head voice well, but there was just something in her voice that I was missing. I was missing that additional metallic quality that I love in many mezzo singing Preziosilla, as thankless as this role is. I was missing that extra chestiness. I was missing that extra steeliness. I was missing all of that dramatic intensity that would have made Preciosilla stand out as a character, unless I forget about that round quality and that overall strength that I love in a mezzo-soprano such as Oralia Dominguez, who also sang contralto roles such as Sosostres and Erda. Those were qualities that I was missing with Yana Kurzova, but it is not to take away from the potential as well as her overall vocal strengths and theatrical strengths as a singing actress. She was still able to do a fine job as Preziosila. It's just that there were occasions that the chest tones were kind of veering on the hollow, but she did have them. And there were times that her head voice was kind of unsupported, but that is otherwise quite the dent to pay in terms of what she was able to accomplish as Preziosila. So I still have to give Yana Kurutsova some credit where credit is due in terms of her theatricality and what she was able to accomplish as this gypsy girl. And I can never forget about the fine singing as accomplished by Byungil Kim as the surgeon 
Christian who used his trademark bass baritone slash basso cantante voice very well for this particular role and also had the strong stage presence to boot and Karis Tucker using her gorgeous and plush lyric mezzo voice to make the role of Kura come to life, as well as bring in sufficient strength to make this character stand out well. And I also have to give kudos to Ronnie Maciel as the Indio for making his performance quite the treat to watch. And I would like to see him in more roles as his own actor, because even though the role of the Indio was kind of unnecessary, I thought that Ronnie Maciel was able to use his stage presence and his overall physical flexibility to make this character come alive. So overall, the singing did have its great moments, especially from Jorge de Leon, Roman Burdenko, Marco Mimitsa, Stephen Bronk, Patrick Rowan, Yachung Huang, and Yana Kurutsova, because they were able to steal the show from everybody's feet. And even though I will still argue that Hulkar Sabirova's voice is rather light for Leonora de Vargas and should stick with more florid Verdi singing, I still thought that they were able to contribute superbly to the overall all fine singing that I experienced tonight. Equally as great were Byungil Kim and Karis Tucker as the surgeon and Kura respectively, and lest I forget about Ronnie Mafiel, who was able to make the Indio come alive as a character thanks to his monologues. When all is said and done, I have to give a lot of kudos to all the singers for doing such fine jobs in each of their roles, and the conducting done by Paolo Carignani was superb all the way through. He made sure that everybody from the orchestra to the chorus to the singers stuck well with each other and really cooperated with each other extremely well. And he was very aware as to where something needs to be forte, where something needs to be piano, and where something just needs to go all out. And he did so with passion and interest. And you can always rely on the chorus and the orchestra of the Deutsche Oper Berlin to deliver reliable pieces of work as well as depend on them for really amping the overall listening and viewing experience at the Deutsche Oper Berlin. So overall, with a production I was not a huge fan of, in terms of the really jumbled directions that Frank Kastorf's production of Verdi's La Forza del Destino went to, as well as some singing that did leave a bit to be desired in terms of Hulka Sabirova being otherwise rather light for Dona Leonora de Vargas, or even Philip Yekal being way too light for singing the role of Fra Melitone, I thought that everybody else still managed to do great jobs in their roles, including Jorge de Leon as Don Alvaro, Roman Burdenko as Don Carlo, Marco Mimitsa as Padre Guardiano, and Yana Kurzova as Preziosilla. These four were the absolute stars of the evening, and I definitely salute them for everything that they continue to do as singers and as performers, especially especially Jorge de Leon in terms of letting his voice ring throughout the theater and for stealing the show from everybody's feet. And for those of you who caught Verdi's La Forza del Destino at the Deutsche Oper Berlin, what did you think of it? Did you really like the production or did you not really like it? And did you feel like it was totally distracting to your viewing experience as well as your listening experience? Was there a singer you particularly liked whether it be Hulkar Sabirova as Dona Leonora de Vargas, Jorge de Leon as Don Alvaro, Roman Bordenko as Don Carlo, Marco Mimitsa as Padre Guardiano, Stephen Bronk as Marquesa de Calatrava, Patrick Rowan as the mayor, Philip Yekal as Fra Melitone, Yachun Huang as Mastro Trabuco, Yana Kurutsova as Preziosilla, Byungil Kim as the surgeon, or Karis Tucker as Kura? Or do you feel like there was something about this production that you did not like, or the singing that you were not a huge fan of? Please comment below and let me know. Well, that's it for my review of Giuseppe Verdi's La Forza del Destino at the Deutsche Oper Berlin. Tune in tomorrow for my review of Verdi's Aida also at the Deutsche Oper Berlin starring Byungil Kim as Ramfis and Jorge Puerta as Radames, as well as Dinara Alieva as Aida. So until then, 
Good night, everybody, and blessed Good Friday.